Alrighty, welcome back to Shooting It Straight. The topic of discussion today is whether muzzle energy has any real advantages that could benefit concealed carriers or in other defensive applications involving the use of a handgun. It has been shown for many decades now that while high muzzle energy may not play a large role in incapacitating a human, it can indeed have a significant effect on stopping power or stopping the attack. Now we're having uh, this discussion today because you know you know that I insist that in order to improve your chances of winning a lethal force confrontation you must learn to use any and every possible advantage even if it's only a slight advantage. So let's take a look at the muzzle energy debate. Now the claim, one of the claims that we're constantly hearing is that muzzle energy, and you may hear it called kinetic energy, uh, that muzzle energy doesn't matter or it has no value. In other words, they claim that kinetic energy from a fired bullet has zero effect on incapacitation. Well, I tend to agree with this to a large extent when we're speaking of handgun cartridges and incapacitation, as I cannot find any evidence to support an argument. Rifle velocities are another matter entirely. That's a different discussion. Now whether kinetic energy from a handgun bullet uh, has any effect on stopping power or not, well, that's still a hotly debated uh, item, too, for some reason. So I'd like to offer my input using both science and empirical evidence, or testimonial evidence, you might want to call it. Now, in order to have a better understanding of this topic, we need to have a rudimentary understanding of what muzzle energy is and what the term incapacitation mean and what the term stopping power actually mean within this particular context because many people try to redefine these terms today and we also need to look at how incapacitation and stopping power each occur well, let's begin by describing what incapacitation means basically it's the state of a person or an animal being rendered unable to attack or to continue an attack or activity. That's incapacitation. Um, if a person is shot directly in the upper region of the CNS or central nervous system, they are immediately rendered physically unable to attack or to continue an attack because they'll be completely paralyzed, right? But now if that shot is much lower, say towards the small of the back, well, they may lose the ability to remain ambulatory. Uh, in other words, they won't be able to stand up. They'll, use, they'll lose the use of their legs. But they may still be able to fire a gun. So uh, in that case, they are immobilized, but they are not incapacitated because they can still pose a threat, right? All right. Now, stopping power is exactly what the term implies, and I have a video on this. Uh, if you don't know much about stopping power, you might want to review that video. Stopping power is, is this. It's the power to stop something. It, plain and simple. In our context today, it's the power to quickly stop an attacker, human or animal, from further attacking. All right. Now it's important to note that this does not require that the fired bullet has the energy or ability um, to throw the attacker across a room nor does it mean that it's got to be a one-shot stop sort of thing. It doesn't mean that at all. If the shot or shots stop the attack, 
then stopping power occurred. Obviously, regardless of the number of shots fired, it was stopped. And what stopped it? Well, the shots. Stopping power. Power by the shots stopped it, right? In the context of this video, incapacitation usually comes about through either a direct CNS shot, which in self-defense shootings are fairly, fairly rare, okay? And if they are, if you do get a CNS shot, it's probably more out of luck than anything else. But more often than not, it is the loss of blood from a major blood-bearing organ. Loss of blood uh, results in loss of blood pressure and oxygen to the brain, which then leads to unconsciousness and then to death if medical attention is not immediately available. Additionally, the, the larger path of the destroyed tissue that's created by the bullet, you may know it as bullet wound or a bullet channel wound, uh, the, the larger that is, the quicker the blood loss is going to be also. Uh, just a little bit quicker, but quicker nonetheless. Uh, so, thus, the quicker incapacitation will occur. Now, stopping power, let me get my drink here. Stopping power is a little bit different. All right, stopping power doesn't always result in incapacitation. But incapacitation always results in stopping power, and sometimes from stopping power. Uh, if an attacker is shot in the arm and immediately runs off, then stopping power occurred because he stopped his attack, did he not? But incapacitation did not occur in this case because the attacker still had the ability to, ta to attack. He just chose not to continue the attack. So the shot did display stopping power. Alright. Incapacitation and stopping power both involve many variables and factors. Rarely does either rarely does either one of them involve only a single factor. Uh, Caliber and power can often play a role in how quickly a person may become incapacitated or stopped, but it's not the sole determining factor overall. Muzzle energy is the amount of energy that a bullet carries with it directly out of the muzzle. This is also commonly referred to as kinetic energy, which is basically energy in motion. Okay, if an object is moving or in motion, then it has kinetic energy. In ballistic terms, the heavier and faster the projectile is moving, the more kinetic energy it has with it, generally speaking. Now, to determine the amount of muzzle energy that a particular bullet carries, um, there's, a for there's a formula used that you can use Wait, I'll show you. Oh. All right. Um, there's a particular formula used. Uh, let's see. Kinetic energy equals half right, of the mass of an object times the velocity of it squared. Okay. Uh, kinetic energy equals half of the mass of an object times the square of its velocity. Now there's uh, there are other ways to express this formula but I found that, that 
this one is the easiest one to do and you probably won't even have to do it you won't even have to calculate it uh, unless you're a hand loader or something like that because muzzle energy of just about all ammo out there can be found online many sources online uh, and even on most of the boxes sometimes the box itself will have that it'll give you the velocity of course the bullet weight too but it'll give you the muzzle velocity and sometimes it'll also give you the um, muzzle energy that comes along with that so you probably won't even need to do this but if you do that's how you do it all right muzzle energy is uh, typically typically measured in foot pounds which is a standard unit of energy uh, used as part of the English engineering units EEU you probably know it as which is a set of measurements commonly used here in the United States one foot pound translates to the amount of kinetic energy it takes to move a one pound object the distance of one foot that's foot pound all right in terms of uh, <clears throat> terminal ballistics when a bullet strikes a body and makes entrance that energy is transferred to the body most of it now some of this energy radiates out from the bullet sending ripples of energy like energy waves uh, through the soft tissue uh, much the same way that ripples are, are created you know when you when you're at a pond and you toss a stone in there and you have the water ripples well it's the same way in human tissue now that uh, energy shock wave can sometimes deliver a powerful stun to the attacker depending on several factors involved most people most people refer to this as hydrostatic shock which I think is incorrect because uh, static the word static means motionless or stationary well the soft tissue is moving so it's not static so I think the correct description should be hydrokinetic shock hydrokinetic in motion shock uh, these ballistic energy waves from a bullet from the bullet impact can and often do induce a concussive like effect in humans causing momentary acute neurological symptoms now while these um, while these energy waves or waves of energy or ripples whatever uh, they do move tissue it does not ordinarily result in damage to that tissue now in some instances it may cause slight bleeding from some of the capillaries in there but the extent is nearly immeasurable as a bullet passes through soft tissue the energy with it will produce a temporary stretch cavity but only for a microsecond this temporary stretch cavity immediately collapses on itself and returns to its normal state as the bullet is passing through you can see that you can see examples of that uh, in the synthetic uh, syn those synthetic ballistic gel blocks when a bullet hit you can see that happening right there in slow mo it's uh, it's important to remember now that that when we're speaking of handgun ammo the only thing that causes damage to tissue or anything else is whatever comes into actual contact with the bullet itself which is called the permanent cavity that's a permanent cavity that creates a permanent cavity now, now, now this does not apply to rifle ammo that travels at a much higher velocity like I said that's a different that's a different world there now so whether whether it's called muzzle energy kinetic energy transferred energy or impact energy it doesn't matter 
It's all basically the same thing. It's widely accepted that this energy in and of itself does not incapacitate. Uh, now, also, why do you think most ammo manufacturers, particularly those that manufacture rounds to be used in hunting, uh, why do you think they routinely stamp the velocity and muzzle energy on the boxes of that ammo? Well, it's because muzzle energy uh, is often used to roughly estimate the destruction potential of that particular cartridge or its lethality in some cartridges, especially useful in the hunting application. Now, it's also been shown that... Uh, the sudden impact of high kinetic energy has been enough to discontinue an attack in some instances. Sometimes when an offender realizes that he's been shot, he often decides to cease his actions and flee. That is extremely common. Getting hit with 500 foot pounds of energy can very easily cause the offender to take a step back and to pause if not flee altogether being astutely aware, aware now that he's been shot, you know. Now, back in the mid-1990s, uh, a research team of the FBI conducted interviews of a particular category of federal inmates. Of the inmates that had been shot during their crime, whether by police or by civilian, more than 70% of them said that the impact of the shot alone was enough to cause them to stop their aggression or action and to flee the scene. I don't know how much more proof you need. So the conclusion is that although muzzle energy may not always play a role in stopping the bad guy, it certainly cannot be discarded by saying that it doesn't matter or that it plays no role. It's been clearly proven that it can. If the possibility or chance that muzzle energy can give us uh, at least a slight advantage in a lethal confrontation, uh, you know, then it would be foolish of us to ignore it, I think. Now, the caution here is to balance things out. For example, let's not insist on high muzzle energy if doing so would sacrifice something like good bullet penetration or other desired terminal ballistics uh, performance of that bullet, right? Okay, so, well, I hope you got something useful out of this video. My goal is to help you make choices that will increase your chances of winning a lethal encounter on the streets. So, thanks for watching. I'm Antonius, and I'll still be shooting it straight with you next time. Until then... Ciao.